Hey, this is me building a $3 million a year business in public. The way these videos always go is I start by doing some YouTube comment Q&A, then I do some growth stats across YouTube, Instagram, and my products, and finally I round up with a daily business improvement. Right now that is a Maker School exclusive, Maker School being my community, which makes 300 grand a month. This is my um, main channel, 139k subs. This is the daily updates one at 7,000. And how I do it is I just go all the way down to the very, very bottom of this answer the oldest questions. So if you guys have any questions you want me to answer, feel free to just ask him on any one of these videos and I will get to them. Noah says, Nick, truly appreciate the value from your videos. I want to know how you'd set up the API keys, password and payment methods when onboarding clients for a new project. Would you set the tools up yourself from your account, but for them, and then you charge them a monthly return or do you set it up from their account, use their passwords, etc.? So the billing and data goes directly to them. I have the billing and the data and everything go directly through them. And then they just share me their username, password, email, everything that I need in order to access the account. So the account is domiciled on them, if that makes sense. The reason why I do this is twofold. One, it makes handoffs really easy. So if you get to the point where you're no longer working with somebody for this thing, you can just say, hey, you have everything that you need. Here's the documentation on projects I've already delivered. Good to go. Goodbye. I love you. See you never. And then uh, number two, when you get people to sign up to these platforms, you can actually use your own affiliate link. And if you use your own affiliate link, you can actually add like three to 5% to your margins basically immediately um, by doing so. So that's how I do it. Um, I don't have them deal with API keys or anything. I just do it all myself. All right. So just wanted to ask here, how do you identify the best niches to provide solutions for? Thank you, Chill Coach 6138 uh how do i identify them generally i look for digital niches so niches that are entirely online or do the vast majority of their business and work online uh, if you think about it the main reason why you do that is because lead sourcing is really easy for them and then if they're a digital business they're usually a little bit more technically minded technically minded enough that they can understand the value of your solutions um, without necessarily being you know so technical that they could just do it themselves the second big thing is that I look for high ticket industries. What I mean by that is just like industries that you can charge a lot of money if you are in that industry. Like if you are doing, I don't know, let's think about it, some sort of high ticket um, um, service fulfillment, you're maybe a managed service provider and then you bill like, I don't know, $1,500 a month on like a one year minimum term. What does that mean? $1,500 a month, one year minimum term, $18,000. Okay. That's your average order value. That's your ticket value. If I can get you a single client, I make you $18,000 in revenue. Well, if I'm charging like four or $5,000, me getting you a single client immediately justifies like three to four months of my expense, right? And you know, I'm not charging three to $4,000, but hopefully you guys understand like, if you guys are charging that, what is the simplest way to like justify your value? It's just get them a single client. Can you do that in three or four months? Like odds are you probably can with good systems. So I look for those as well. And then I personally look ones that don't necessarily do, um, you know, like a lot of, um, like healthcare or legal or financials, because these typically are low compliance industries. Like, yeah, it's just not a big deal for me to, you know, I don't have to like anonymize customer data through XYZ thing, you know? Okay. Randall says, if you only ran your agency to no school, what your content look like then to maximize for inbound leads? If you do content at all, at what point do you start making content? 10K, 20K, really curious your thoughts on this. Sorry. At what point would you start making content? Yeah. Maybe like 10 to $20,000 a month, I would say. Um, this is pretty high margin. So like if you're running an agency and you follow the steps that I suggest here, realistically, you're probably making like, let's say your, your revenue is 20 K. Like you're probably making like 15 K on that. Um, I think 15 K or like $200,000 a year is sufficient for you to zoom out a little bit and like take the outside view as opposed to just always be worrying, where does my next paycheck come from? Cause if you try and start content before you get to the point where you have enough money to live and sustain yourself and you know, you're making more money than, than most people do, you start making like really shitty short-term decisions. You start getting lost in data. You start like really just worrying about over-optimizing as opposed to just continue doing the thing that, you know, you know, on some level will, will make you win. So uh, I recommend having a little bit of money before you start content. Don't just dive into it. What would my content look like to maximize for inbound leads? Um, hmm. Well, honestly, I don't really know what I do that's different, but I probably would start adding CTAs where it's like, Hey, you know, I'm happy to build this for you. My team and I do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, we're, you know, we've, we've delivered all of the insert cool case studies. Uh, that you could ever possibly want. I'm not doing any of that stuff right now. And in hindsight, I probably should. Like, there's no real cost to me to do that. It's not like that's super salesy or anything. I could probably insert that halfway through any one of my builds and have no issues with that. So uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't make the content look super different. I think I'm kind of like the the good the good point here. I, I would certainly do less like AI automation agency content for sure, because that doesn't have as much value. More systems, how I'd automate a plumbing business, how I'd automate a, a HVAC business, how I'd automate a digital marketing agency, how I'd automate this. Um, but for the most part, I mean, you know, I've already done that and I, I do that. 
Sorry in advance for reaching out. Thanks, David. Uh, using looms and emails with a mailbox is your mass sending emails in a regular cold email campaign differ, differ from sending looms or the volume difference between value per email dropping. If using weird domains for loom outreach, how many looms per day would you recommend? Yeah, I would actually. I would segregate the mailboxes for loom outreach uh, versus, uh, you know, the other outreach that you're doing. So if you're going to send looms, basically you have, I don't know, let's say nine mailboxes. Hopefully you guys can see this. But you guys have nine mailboxes, right? And you want to experiment with sending looms. I'd actually segregate so that three mailboxes are going to be like, you know, your your loom ones, and then another six here will be like uh, your your normal mailboxes for I don't know video uh, uh, cold email. Let, let's just say like I don't know automated. Okay. The reason why you're segregating them is because if you don't, then um, some of these emails are going to land in spam because of links. And so deliverability across your entire mailbox stack will suffer. Uh, whereas this way, you can actually isolate the deliverability hits to the three if you just screw up and you send them all, all really weird. So here, let's say you send 10 vids per day times three accounts. I mean, collectively, this is 30 looms a day, right? What you do is, and instantly you set it up so that you only pull from these three mailboxes. And then here, I don't know, you just do the normal stack. So you do 30 a day times six accounts, you do 180 a day. So in this way, you're sending 180 a day with like your semi-automated personalization approach, and then 30 looms a day through like your totally manual approach. Like, yeah, that's, that's probably what a high quality breakdown would be like. How would the copy for an email with a loom look like? Would that include a link to the loom in the first email? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you would just say, you know, same thing as like customized personalization, except if you're spending the time to do the loom thing, I would also just spend a few additional seconds customizing some template yourself as opposed to having AI do it. So have some uh, personalized icebreaker. You know, hey, Nick, really love your stuff and following you for a long time. Super refreshing to see X, Y, and Z. I want to save you $20,000 this month. I know it's totally out of left field, but like I work specifically with whatever. Um, I just recorded a video that gives you everything. I also include templates in the link in the Loom video description. Um, you don't have to do this yourself. You could pass this off to somebody else in your team. Uh, Alternatively, if you wanted me to maybe take care of this for you, just like respond with a yes, and I will do everything. I'll take care of it end to end. You don't need to worry about anything. That's probably what I would do. What's the best call to action in a first versus second email? Oh, by the way, that's what I would do for myself. I'm just trying to think of it than like, hey, in my in my shoes. Um, there are a variety of different ways you can do this to other people, and it kind of depends on the industry and it depends on the specific thing you're selling, right? Like if you're selling something that you can actually send, then I would showcase it in Loom, and then I would actually like send it in the Loom video description as well. Uh, it just de depends on your sales, but I'm assuming you're like contacting me for YouTube optimization. That's kind of like, like, like when I say this stuff, that's what I'm thinking because I get a couple of these. Um, anyway, yeah, but this sounds pretty good. Two links in an email or one change anything in terms of spam flagging? I don't know. Probably, probably it does. Tommy G4 says, no go for make is a limitation on ops. You can reach 1K in no time on the free plan with just error fixing and experimenting. You have workflow limitations, but unlimited executions within one. Yeah, that's definitely one of them for sure. I mean, you know, it's a cost thing, right? Like if you're making money, none of this shit matters because if, I mean, if it does matter, then you're like horrifically under optimizing. Think about it, man, like N8N plan, 25, 50 bucks a month, something like that, right? I don't even know the cost. That's how little it is at the grand scheme of things. Um, make plan $18 a month for uh, 10,000 uh, uh, ops. It's like, does, does any of this stuff really matter when you're driving over like a thousand bucks a month in value, which is like a, a minimum, you know, that's like 2% versus 5%. Like, sure. I understand that it makes sense to optimize the margins, but that's not really the problem that you should be solving for right now. Right? Like the problem you should be solving for is like, one, do I have any clients at all? And two, do, um, you know, is, is the value I'm delivering for these clients, like in the, in the triple digits or more. Okay, anyway, um, hey, love thing. I also like fan of. Worked great for a while. Got plenty of leads that week. Was crazy. But when I changed location to UK, the reply rate dropped. Most of them are negative. Same copy, same personalization approach. Why it's not working? A lot of people are using the same approach. Can you give me some dynamic formula like how to make variants effectively? All right, so Emperor WO's problem is that they were trying uh, a campaign somewhere and it was going pretty well. And then they tried it, they modified it put it in the UK and then it stopped working as well. Well, um, from my understanding, it's a saturation issue where like a lot of people are using the same approach in the UK and because of the market sophistication, your approach just isn't good enough anymore in the UK. You have to like evolve and become even better. Alternatively, it might just be that that exact approach doesn't work. Maybe that exact icebreaker formula was taken by somebody else that like hit up every business in the UK. You got to keep in mind that UK is a pretty small market comparatively speaking, right? Compared to like, you know, uh, North America. Um, so like odds are some of those leads have been run through a bunch of times. Also, it could be your lead sourcing. Uh, I, I heard or I read somewhere that like Apollo 
leads in the UK are older for whatever reason, maybe it has something to do with like data privacy stuff. So their LinkedIn scrapes haven't been as often. So if you want to go direct to source, like scrape LinkedIn sales navigator, you'll perform better. Um, that's definitely like a, it, it's not like an offer issue. It's like, well, it is an offer issue, but it's like an offer to a specific market issue, you know? Anyway, I know you've experienced, there must be a formula approach to use. Well, yeah, I mean, like subliminally, I don't know for sure, but um, yeah, I just, I, I iterate the hell out of my campaigns for sure. And I do it like on like a once, uh, once a month basis, I would, uh, sorry, once a week basis on average for um, most of my clients. It depends on the volume. Like if you send uh, a ton of volume, then you can iterate faster than once a week. But I also just like erring on the side of less iteration. My whole life I've iterated too, too quickly, honestly. So nowadays I just try sticking with the same thing for uh, longer than I thought. So yeah, you know, test like length of copy, test like bluntness of copy, test like offers, obviously, and uh, so on and so forth. If you're building an actual agentic chatbot, what you want to deliver is the backend API that exposes a chat endpoint, which can also support streaming responses. You deploy a microservice code base with a script the client can easily use to deploy to their cloud provider, packages a digital product, and sell it. Uh, this seems this seems really complicated, though. No, are you discussing? It depends on your market, I suppose. I think if you're selling something to like an enterprise company that has the infrastructure to manage this, then yeah, for sure. But, um, but if you're selling an actual agentic chatbot, like the total volume of all agentic chatbots sold proportionally, 95% of them are going to be to small mid-sized businesses, right? So if you're building an actual agentic chatbot, like what you probably want to deliver, statistically speaking, is not a backend API that exposes a slash chat endpoint that can support streaming responses. Clients don't care about that. What you want to deliver is you want to, you know, ask them, where do you want to put the chatbot and then you want to have access to that and then you just want to take your little n8n asian code snippet and put it up there like i, I do get the spirit of the of the answer shaheen it's just a little you know like the, there, there's some nuance here that we're missing right there's some nuance here that we're missing like if we are doing this for some enterprise thing where they have the team and the infrastructure to take your um microservice code base and then deploy it to their provider yeah but um the vast majority of instances in which chatbots are currently being implemented on the internet are not that. So, uh, no, I, I probably would. Yeah, I would disagree with that. Okay, one more from Vincent. Free content so much more valuable than most content I've paid for. Thank you. Is there a way to auto-reply on Audible calls and people reply to us instantly? Uh, for sure, yeah. Um, I can't figure out how to make it a reply rather than a completely separate email. Yeah, the reply stuff, uh, it depends. Like, how are you, how are you responding to these? Are you using um, the email module? If you're using the email module, you can actually do this pretty easily here. Let me... Uh, show you what I mean. There are headers in emails. Excuse me. And oh, geez, I think I forget the exact header. Um, but basically, my man, and sorry, I can't get into more detail here. But uh, one of these headers is like your Gmail reply header or something. And it's like, um, it's an ID. And if you feed in the right key, uh, the right ID, so the ID of the thing that you are responding to the thread or whatever, then when you reply to it, as long as you say re, uh, re in the subject line, and then the subject is whatever the guy or girl wrote to you, then it will automatically thread as a reply. Um, the thing on instantly is you obviously have multiple mailboxes, so you have to be a little bit more diligent in like how you do the logic and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's more or less it. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay, I'm going to leave it there and then just do some quick brand stats because i got to get out of here in a minute. But let's go brand stats. Um, for those of you guys that don't know, brand stats is just like a Google sheet where I track all of my numbers on a daily bit on a daily basis. So the big number that I'm concerned about tracking obviously is my total subscriber count. It's kind of like priority number one for me right now. I did some writing on that. You can check the lucid spark if you want more. This is the daily updates channel. So 7,027. That's my other one. And then my Instagram channel here is 220,457. So bigger in numbers, but if you multiply the average watch time here, which is like six minutes or something by this, which is like 12 seconds. This is like five. This is like a 50 X difference in watch time, despite only being like, a I don't know, like 0 0.7, 0 0.65 or something. So collectively, like my YouTube gets me, what's that 30 times more watch minutes. So uh, anyway, I'm saying this because a lot of people have been like, Nick, your Instagram's so big and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, the numbers are big, but the thing that matters, the number of minutes of people consuming my content, um, is a lot smaller. Okay, let's also track churn. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, churn reduction is something I am very interested in for Maker School, and I started actually tracking that number yesterday. I'm so stupid. I should have been tracking this for like weeks. Uh, but anyway, Maker School churn was 23.69 on the 20th. It's 23.41 today on the 21st. 
And I'm looking forward to seeing where it's going to be the next day uh, tomorrow. Now, I should have posted a Maker School community exclusive yesterday, and I'm um, just being in Montreal, I've yet to do that. So I'm going to head over to an office with a friend of mine, and I'm going to work through one of those community exclusives today. Uh, and then maybe I'll record it like later tonight when I get home, but I, I need to pump out these community exclusives if I do want to reduce my churn. So, um, yeah, just something that, uh, that I'm going to do despite being on this trip. Aside from that, just general life stuff. Montreal is a beautiful city. Uh, people here seem incredible. The mixture of like, uh, French culture and English culture is beautiful. I will say that they have a lot of, uh, What's the term? Well, they got a lot of young people. Let's put it that way. And because of the young people, the, the focus, I would say culturally is different. A lot more arts. Uh, it's extraordinarily diverse. I used to think that like Vancouver was diverse. Um, and then I went to Toronto and then Montreal and I'm like, okay, well, that's what diversity actually means. Like, you know, diversity is just like such a, such a loaded term that people try and use to, you know, win some cultural brownie points. And so they're like, Vancouver is so diverse. It's like, uh, it's not diverse, like population proportion wise, nowhere near as diverse as uh, somewhere like here. You have all sorts of cultures, all intermixing and meshing and doing really cool shit. So yeah, super excited about this. Um, gonna let you guys know how the churn reduction goes. Wanted to thank you guys for all the tips that you've been giving me over the course of the last couple of days regarding churn reduction. I've had some awesome insights here. Um, and just like my mind would not have connected a few of the dots that I had, had I not been sharing all this stuff publicly. So thank you very much for all of that. And, uh, yeah, super stoked on seeing where that next chapter takes me. Um, also spinning up the agency. I think I told you guys in like a video a while back, but spinning up the agency and we're actually just at like the, the proposal, uh, we sent in a bunch of proposals for a bunch of, um, gigs that we were considering taking on. So that's going to be really cool to like spin up the revenue of the agency. Again, I want to get past a hundred thousand dollars a month again. Uh, it's going to look a little bit different because I don't want to be like fundamentally involved in the service delivery like I was before, despite wanting to productize it and stuff. So I'll play that by ear and I'll keep you guys posted, but yeah, I just wanted to fill you in on where all that stuff is. Thank you very much for watching. Looking forward to the next time. Cheers.